Good afternoon to you. Mark Suddeth, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is now Thursday, the 20th of June, 2024. On the update today, I'm going to make the case, at least from my end, as to why I think we could have a tropical storm for Florida tomorrow. That's in Vest Area 92L. I'll present the evidence, and we'll see what happens. And we'll take a look at some other things happening in the tropics, including Alberto and its chances of maybe becoming another named storm or surviving long enough to be a named storm in the eastern Pacific. And then at the end of today's update, I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to show you how you plot a tropical storm or hurricane on our paper tracking map here. Just a couple minutes for you. Some people don't know. Some people grew up and everything's been on computer and they're like, yeah, I don't know how to plot one of those on a paper map. And if you do, well, you can skip that part of the video. That is just fine. But a little refresher course on using a paper tracking chart. All right, thanks for tuning in. Let's see what we got out there. First of all, National Hurricane Center homepage, several, well, two X's and one O out here, getting ready for tic-tac-toe, it seems. There's Alberto moving inland over Mexico. Big rainmaker, certainly brought a lot of surge. I say a lot. It covered a huge area, and there was some flooding down there, so the impacts were fairly significant for this to be so far away from the Texas coast. This is another system that we have to watch. Probably going to move into this direction over the next few days into the southern Bay of Campeche. And then here is 92L, which, don't be surprised, if this comes inland over here tomorrow as a minimal tropical storm, wouldn't surprise me in the least. And as I said in the intro, I will explain why I think that way as we progress. First things first, here we have... Let's get rid of that first of all. Maybe later. Thank you very much. First things first, there's Alberto spinning away over inland areas of Mexico. You can bet there's some very heavy rain underneath all of this. Probably needed heavy rain, much needed heavy rain. I mean, hey, you got to take it even if it is heavy. This could move across and get into the East Pack where it might develop further. We'll have to wait and see about that. Meanwhile, that old gyre sitting down here still, pieces of energy trying to come off of it and maybe develop into something as we talked about here earlier in today's update, maybe something in the Bay of Campeche in the coming days. But the main area right now we're going to watch is this right here. That's in Vest Area 92L. And while the National Hurricane Center says that it has 40% probabilities for development over the next 48 to 168 hours, I mean, it'll be inland over Florida about this time tomorrow afternoon, I think, based on experience and what we know about that area, and again, past experience, that can be a huge clue in a lot of what we watch in the weather, how the past can help us understand the future. I think there's a pretty decent chance, I would say maybe 70% chance, just me personally and professionally looking at this, that this becomes a name storm, and if it does, the name would be Beryl, B-E-R-Y-L, something like that. The next name on the list is Barrel. So I'll show you as we move on uh, the Barrel from 2012 that was almost in that same exact spot from a different kind of source of energy. Different but similar. And it was the strongest out-of-season tropical storm to make landfall in the U.S. We'll get to that in just a little bit. First of all, current storm info on Alberto real quick. Deep convection over Mexico. There's the track heading west surface plot and then some of the models do take this out into the east pack so we'll wait and see how that evolves over the coming days and then we'll go from there deal with it as we need to right 92l though now again looking at the satellite this is the infrared it's like come on mark that's not anything no it's not on a grand scale but there are thunderstorms it, it does have a little bit of easterly shear kind of impinging on it from the east that's what we call it easterly Pretty strong high pressure to its north, sort of pushing everything along. There is abundant dry air surrounding the system. But one important thing to note, it is small, and therefore the global models don't have as good a resolution or a handle on it overall. And thus, I think you have to look back at the past. That can be a helper, a little bit of an aid for trying to figure out what this might do. And what's in front of it? There's the Gulf Stream. That could help aid in some deeper thunderstorm activity. And I do believe we could all agree it has probably overperformed to this point so far. It's probably a little bit more vigorous than most of us would have thought that it would be by now. 
So why would that stop, especially in a year like 2024, when the background state is generally favorable overall, several factors coming together that lead me to believe this very well could be a tropical storm once it reaches Florida. But remember, that's just a label. A tropical storm is just a label we give them. The, um, the impacts, the effects, hey, if it's a depression or a disturbance or a 40 mile per hour tropical storm, those impacts are not going to differ very much at all. Let me show you the uh, visible high res though. Let's switch this out. Now this looks a lot more interesting, doesn't it? Low level circulation clearly embedded right in there. There is some thunderstorm activity around it. So it does have a closed low level circulation, no doubt. And the hurricane hunters, the men and women from Keesler and the 53rd Aerial Reconnaissance Group, uh, they're all out there. I don't know how many, probably one plane, right? They're checking this out. So we're going to know by 5 p.m. Eastern this afternoon what's happening with this system. And for those of you that follow that kind of stuff on social media, the high definition observation or the H Dobbs and so forth, I know they do that over at Storm 2K regularly. You'll know before everybody else, won't you? And some of that stuff, of course, is even on tropical tidbits. But this is not nothing, if that makes sense. A double negative there, right? This is a large weather feature, and it will bring some squally conditions, uh, you know, maybe tropical storm force winds, some beach erosion possible, certainly some heavy rain that goes along with the squally conditions, doesn't it? Sure does. So we need to watch this and be ready for it in the northeast part of Florida, maybe southern Georgia tomorrow. The vorticity signature of 92L, fairly decent there. That's bundling together pretty well. It's not all stretched out like all of this down here or this over here. You know, that's pretty good, especially for a small, weak system overall. The pressures are not very low. It's not that vigorous. It's not like one of these huge pieces of energy that will eventually come off Africa and track west. We know what those look like, and this is not it. But... That doesn't mean that this can't have locally a little bit of a bite as it comes in here somewhere, probably northeast Florida, maybe extreme southern Georgia, southeast Georgia, something like that, over the next 24 to 30 hours or so. Water temperatures, just, just let's just take a look at that real quick. And um, I wish they had a version of this where we could see all of Florida. I don't know if there's one out there from this particular uh, link that I use off of the NOAA site, but that's all right. We can look at it from a couple of points of view. There's northern Florida right there, and yes, our system would eventually need to cross the Gulf Stream, which can be interpolated as going south like that, right? And that's about 28 Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit, so it does have some warm water to traverse. Water temperatures will be increasing along its path until it gets pretty close to the coast up here. Then you have this corridor where the water temperatures drop just a little bit. I say drop, they're still warm enough. And those purplish colors, whatever. Yeah, that's about in here. Still 81, 81 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. So definitely a warm enough water pattern uh, in front of this system. Now, separately, I just want to show you this. All these blues in here that have shown up now, remember this was yellow and even some oranges recently, before Alberto, but that huge circulation that's been just sitting down here has sort of stirred up the gulf a little bit and we have chiseled away at those peak temperatures peak for june they were really hot relatively speaking and i mean actually i mean 30 celsius 86 fahrenheit whatever it was that's pretty toasty that has been you know chopped away just a little bit but hey it's only june 20th and we still have plenty of sun angle in fact today is the longest day of the year the summer solstice you can bet that the gulf of mexico barring any future disturbances will warm right back up and 29 28 degrees uh, celsius or low 80s fahrenheit most of science by the way is in metric just in case you're wondering why does he always say celsius pretty much all of science is based on the metric system i digress this is plenty warm make no mistake about it if the upper levels are favorable and the mid levels have enough moisture and you don't have a bunch of dry air around and shear if those three things are positive you need about 80, 81 degrees Fahrenheit at the ocean surface, yeah, fairly deep down, 300 or 400 meters, and you can get a very intense hurricane. So just kind of pointing that out. But Alberto and the disturbance, the big gyre down there, has changed the surface water, the skin of the ocean there, the gulf, a little bit. 
All right, speaking of anomalies, or now jumping to anomalies, it's kind of interesting. In the eastern Atlantic, we've kind of had a little bit of a cooling. I say a little bit. It's still way above where it should be. And uh, the heart of the area of the positive anomalies has shifted to the central tropical Atlantic. Pretty warm waters relative to average to the far north Atlantic, way up north. But then the subtropics here, right about where they should be, maybe just a little warmer. And then the Gulf has cooled off just a little bit relative to average and, of course, in reality. Now, look, this is what helps me to say, hey, maybe 92L has a better chance than just 40%. Way back in 2012, we had a system that was subtropical in nature, finally became tropical. I was there for it along uh, the Florida coast with my friend and colleague Greg Nordstrom, and that was 2012's version of Barrel. Will we get a repeat here uh, in 2024? We'll have to wait and see about that. What is that, 12 years, right? We'll see. But, yeah, similar location almost exactly a somewhat similar track, not exactly right. You're not going to have a perfect match. This came in from the northeast. The system 92L is going to come in from this way and make its way up like that, something to that effect anyway. But it is possible, and this was at the end of May 2012. The system we're looking at now that could become barrel, you know, it's towards the end of June. And that's what it looked like right before landfall, Pretty well-developed system there, was subtropical, became fully tropical. So yeah, I think it's possible that this system does overachieve just a little bit more. What about the GFS? Well, there's the remnants of Alberto, barely discernible here at the 850 millibar level of the atmosphere, about 5,000 feet up. Got all these mountains in here, and those are 5,000 feet or higher, so you don't have much weather there because there's mountains in the way. There's our bump. All right, in the height field and whatnot related to 92L. So what I like to look for is what does the structure resemble here? And as we move through time, no, that does not look very impressive. But look right there, right at 24 hours out tomorrow morning, just enough of, that's like a closed height line. That's the easiest way to describe it. And that just tells me, very simply, a little bit more organization right before landfall there. And similar to... What happens down here when these systems uh, come in perpendicular, the tightening of everything with that cur curved coastline of Florida and Georgia, similar to the Western Gulf, it wouldn't surprise me if this tightens up right before it comes in tomorrow, briefly becoming tropical storm barrel. That is my case laid out in front of you. So we'll see how that works out, right? It goes on in and mills around uh, southern Georgia. Could be a big rainmaker. We'll see. In fact, well, let's take a look at the precip and moisture part here, the humidity. Yeah, lots of dry air all over the place. It's got its own little cocoon in here of some protection from that dry air. But there's a couple other things to notice, too. Look at that 1029 millibar surface high and all of these isobars. So these are your lines of equal pressure at the surface. And as this system comes in, you're going to get what we call a pressure gradient. Nothing ridiculous, but that onshore flow combination of the high to the north with easterly wind and the counterclockwise rotation around 92L, maybe depression or barrel or whatever. Yes, you could get some onshore flow up here. That could give us some coastal flooding, maybe even into the low country of South Carolina. Just something to pay attention to over the next few days. And then look at all of this moisture. Holy mackerel. A lot of moisture and humidity down there between 700 and 300 millibars of the atmosphere. So not at the surface, not way up high either, but kind of in the middle, a lot of that. And then look, even down there, the GFS pinpointing the next area that could develop over the next few days. And this takes us out to a week. And I'll talk about dry air. There you go. There's a nice trough coming in to kick out some of that humidity over the southeast, maybe as we round out the month. We'll have to just see about that. All right, this is interesting. I want to show you this because, I mean, come on. If you saw this yesterday on social media, that, my friends, is a dust storm or what we call a haboob. And it's in New Mexico, parts of northern Mexico. Huge area of thunderstorms went up. And then you get the hail and the heavy rain, and that cools the air, and that air is dense, and it falls, and it spreads out. You ever open a freezer, one of those big old freezers, and cold air comes out and it spills onto the floor, especially in a uh, hot environment around it, 
You've seen it. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, that's the same kind of thing here. The hail does actually help to cool the air. You get these big downdrafts. Even the heavy rain can do that. We call it rain-cooled air. And it sinks and it spreads out pretty violently there. Lots of pictures and video on social media of that. And even uh, some incredible imagery of the hail and people getting stuck in flash flooding. I mean, New Mexico with the terrible fire recently and now this is like, man. Land of enchantment, my rear end is the land of lookout. I mean, everything's trying to get you weather-wise from the fire. And you can even see the smoke over here. I mean, geez. Good luck, New Mexico. Seriously, we're hoping for the best for you guys because that's like, yikes. Now, certainly it would have been interesting to be near it and observe it as a weather geek. But that's some pretty dangerous stuff there. Um, just thought I'd point that out in case you missed it. All right. Uh, before I let you go... Yes, I've been hawking my tracking maps because I'm very proud of them. So just real quick, let me show you how you plot one. So if you get one of these in the mail from me, they come in a brown envelope, and I fold them up as neatly as I can. And it's pretty easy. You open that thing up. It's on a nice stock of paper. And down in the left-hand corner, it says how to plot and track tropical cyclones. So you have to understand that the Hurricane Center puts out the info in latitude and longitude. And as I show you on the map, if they said, for example that tropical storm so-and-so was located at latitude 12.5 north, longitude 92.0 west. You just simply find it on this grid, the latitude and longitude markers of the map. You would go up from 10 north, 11, 12, right? And then 12 and a half is halfway between 12 and 13. And then you find where 92 is. And on, in this case, I made it easy. It's right on the longitude line. And you just put a little dot there. And that's the center of the storm. I actually have that plotted as the example here on the map. I've had that on there for a long time. It's right over right over there. You can find it here on the left side of the map if you get one. So that's what happens. And every six hours or so you get a full advisory. Sometimes you get these intermediate advisories every three hours and maybe even a cyclone update. Sometimes those come out hourly. And a year like this where we're expecting a very, very big season one of these maps, if you fill it out all the way, and even if you missed Alberto, there wasn't that many plots that you've missed. You can easily catch up by going to the National Hurricane Center homepage and go back to the archives and go ahead and see what was out there already this year. See? So you just go to the archives and Tropical Cyclone Advisories. There's 2024. There's Alberto. And they're all right here in the public advisories. 20.3, 93.2. And each advisory currently to where it is now is on there. So you can even catch up from where we have already been this year. All right. So if you want to get one of these, we still have some left. Go to the link that I provided in today's description. And for those of you that have bought one, I truly thank you. It is a work of art. You've probably heard this story before, but in case you're new, I drew that map myself many, many moons ago as part of my degree program in geography. That's the first thing that I did as a company was produced these big poster sized tracking charts with all kinds of information on the back side. The back side of these don't have anything. Yeah, because that's what the internet is for, right? But the tracking map has lived on 30 years or something like that later. And I think it's the best one I've ever done. I literally drew it myself in Adobe Illustrator point by point, just like computer animators do now, except everything can be like that. This took many, many years to get to where it is today. And if you've bought one, I do appreciate it. You literally own an original piece of art from yours truly. All right? So if you hopefully understand better now how to track and plot, you can get one at this link here, hurricanetrack.com forward slash track map. And again, I'll put the link in the description of today's video. So we'll stay on top of what's happening, especially with 92L. We'll see if my hunch is right. We'll know more later today once the hurricane hunters send their information back. And I'll be in tomorrow morning and give you an update, and we'll know. We're already, we'll know right then and there. Looking into the future, we'll know how this all works out. All right? As always, thanks for tuning in from all of us at Hurricane Track, our nice community we've got here. We all appreciate you tuning in. I am Mark Suddeth. I'll see you tomorrow morning.